Javier, hola a todos. Bien. Buenos días a todos. Eh, la Cátedra de Oftalmología del Hospital de Clínica Sol hace su contenido semanal. Eh, este, en este caso le toca a la sección cristalino, el doctor Herminio Negri es eh, el director y tenemos el enorme honor de presentarlo a Christopher Riemann, que es lo que nosotros llamamos una mente superior. Eh, él se recibió de ingeniero en John Hopkins University, luego estudió eh, medicina en Maryland, eh, hizo el Residency Training Program y el Vitoretinal Fellowship en, en Cleveland Clinic eh, con Hillel Lewis, eh, y él eh, desarrolló un sinnúmero de dispositivos que todos ustedes utilizan diariamente en la cirugía vitoretinal. Eh, muchas de las cánulas duales que todos usamos las desarrolló Christopher. Eh, él, eh, cuando estudiaba medicina, desarrolló también dispositivos que tienen que ver con la cardiología, no solo con la oftalmología. Eh, ha tenido que ver con el desarrollo de eh, visión 3D. Um, él actualmente es el director de uno de los fellowships eh, más eh, buscados en los Estados Unidos, eh, en Cincinnati Institute, y de hecho cuando él me envía um, su currículum, me envía desde eh, 2006 al 2020 eh, el nombre de cada uno de sus fellows, eh, y la verdad es que es un verdadero honor contar con él hoy eh, en el Ateneo Nuestro de la Cátedra. Él se va a referir a dos temas que yo arbitrariamente elegí, uno es eh, phaco and vitrectomy y luego va a hablar de eh, cirugía vitroretinal endoscópica. Thank you very much for joining us, Christopher. You can start whenever you want, just share your screen. Thank you very much. Perfecto. Muchas uh, buenos días y muchas gracias por el gran honor de, uh, de estar aquí con ustedes hoy día. Voy a hablar en inglés porque si, da, si doy mis uh, pláticas en español va a ser muy doloroso para ustedes. Pero si tienen algunas preguntas, por favor, eh, 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 entiendo casi todo, pero lo que hablo es un poquitito lento. So I'll switch to English and say uh, uh, again, thank you for the honor of speaking to you today. Um, uh, uh, thank you for the honor of speaking to you today. And I'd like to start with a talk that I've been giving for a long time about phacovitrectomy, combined phacovitrectomy. So in, um, in every part of the world other than the United States, phacovitrectomy is common, it is standard of care, it is the preferred approach, whether it's Europe, whether it's in Latin America, whether it's uh, in Asia, it's commonly performed. Only here in the United States is it, a, is it, is it it's very uncommon, We have the retina doctors that are on one side. We have the, uh, the, uh, the, the anterior segment doctors on the other side and, and they rarely collaborate and we do a lot of staged procedures. And I think that's wrong, just like the rest of the world thinks that's wrong. So I've been giving this lecture for many, many years. So the rationale for today's talk is to talk a little bit about why phacovitrectomy is a good idea. I'll talk about some special cases, talk about phacotoric and presents a phacovitrectomy with toric lenses and multifocal lens, and then multifocal lenses will present a little bit of data. So the question simply stated is if a patient presents with some degree of cataract and some posterior pathology uh, for which a vitrectomy is needed, Does the cataract get removed? If so, when, how, and by whom? So <coughs> it is very clear and the literature is absolutely unequivocal that combined surgery can be done with excellent results. It is also clear from the literature for, for the past 20 plus years that combined phacovitrectomy is non-inferior to staged surgeries. 
So th th whether this is this is not a question, the, the question has been asked and answered repeatedly 20 years ago, 25 years ago. The um, evaluating the cataract is different for the anterior segment surgeon for the, uh, than, than in the situation where there's anterior and posterior segment disease. The anterior segment surgeon's approach to the cataract patient is to determine whether or not the cataract is the cause of the patient's symptoms. And then the patient decides thumbs up or thumbs down whether or not they want the surgery to remediate those symptoms. There are very, very few exceptions to that rule. However, when there's cataract and retina disease going on, the approach is different and includes other factors. Visual acuity and patient symptoms don't always reflect visual potential or cataract significance or the need for surgery. Anterior segment, posterior segment, uh, anterior segment or posterior segment pathology or both can limit visual acuity and present needs, the need to operate. Um, so because of that, the surgeon plays a more central role in determining the significance of the cataract relative to the posterior segment pathology and whether the, uh, and whether the cataract should be removed. So a rational approach for these eyes is to classify them into one of four categories. Scenarios where the lens must be removed, the lens should be removed, the lens may be removed, and where the lens should be left alone. Here's an example of a case where the lens must be removed. So this is an eye with a with light perception vision, 75 year old man, a mature cataract through which we can't see. And the ultrasound shows a, uh, a funnel retinal detachment with pre-retinal membranes, PVR. This is an eye where the lens must be removed in order to, to, to fix this retinal detachment. Here's a scenario where the lens should be removed, clearly, unequivocally. There's, uh, this is a 72-year-old man with 20-60 vision in his good right eye and 2200 vision in his left eye because of a macular hole. Um, in these cases, oftentimes, it's a really good idea to look at the other eye to get a sense of cataract significance. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, the cataracts are symmetric. And if the cataracts are symmetric and you have one eye that has retinal disease, like a macular hole, for example, and the other eye which doesn't, sometimes the, the other eye visual acuity can tell you what the, uh, what, what, how much the cataract is visually contributing to what's going on. In this case, the cataracts are symmetric. The contralateral right eye is seen 2060, so it's a 2060 cataract, um, and the macular hole in the left eye has dropped the vision to 2200. So this is clearly and un unequivocally a visually significant cataract. You could probably muddle through and, and do the surgery and close the macular hole without taking out the cataract, but, but there's 100% a, a visually significant cataract not doing this as a combined procedure is just silly. This case here is a little bit more muddled. The patient is 52 years old. The vision in the better seeing right eye is 2040. Um, and there's a 2080 macular pucker in the operative left eye. There is significant cataract, but it's not terrible cataract. Here, you know, I would personally in this scenario, in a 52-year-old, do the combined surgery, but depending on all sorts of factors, you might not do it. It's not completely unreasonable to just take out the uh, uh, to just take off the macular pucker and wait uh, wait another and wait wait until the cataract gets worse, depending on what the patient's wishes are before doing the cataract surgery. This is a case where the lens may be removed. But what I want to do is I want to spend a little bit more time talking about cases where the lens should be left alone. So here's a case, a younger patient with vitro macular traction syndrome. There is a 42-year-old patient. The contralateral eye, and again, we're assuming that these cataracts are symmetric, has a visual acuity of 2020, and you have 2040 visual acuity reduction from vitro macular traction syndrome. Uh, from vitromacular traction syndrome, this eye needs retinal surgery, but the patient is 42, 
and, uh, and, and we know that cataracts are more likely to progress after vitrectomy in patients over the age of 50. Here, probably the lens should be left alone. It's more reasonable to, to, to leave it be. I think taking out a almost clear uh, uh, lens in a 42 year old is a little bit too aggressive. Um, we know that cataracts progress after vitrectomy. Uh, that's also clearly and unequivocally stated in, 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 in the literature known again for over 25, 30 years even. Um, and the key findings, if you kind of summarize what all the studies show, is up to 80% of patients require cataract surgery within two years of vitrectomy. The risk of progression is six to 11 fold higher in patients older versus younger than the age of 50. And there's a 60% increased risk if we're putting a bubble versus not putting in a bubble. The interesting thing is that small gauge surgery has the same risk of cataract progression as 20 gauge surgery. So it's not the vitrectomy itself. Very rarely we bump into the lens and damage the lens iatrogenically causing cataracts. Um, usually the, it's a change in the oxygen concentration, the oxygen distribution that happens from removing the vitreous. So combined surgery is almost always better for the patient. You have anatomic and visual results that are clearly non-inferior. You have one set of surgical risks, one, dose, one instance of psychological stress, one set of post-operative visits and medications, one set of insurance co-pays. And here in the United States, combined surgery is reimbursed less in total than stage surgeries, so is better for the healthcare system as a whole. It also lets you move your sick patients through your clinic a little bit faster. Why see them twice for two sets of post-operative visits when you can see them once? What are the options for combined surgery? Well, you can do phaco vitrectomy or you can do a uh, pars plana lensectomy with a phragmatome, okay, preserving the, you know, uh, preserving the anterior capsule and then uh, uh, putting in a secondary IOL either at the time or, or coming in later. Um, I'm not a huge fan of lensectomy. There's a time and a place for lensectomy. I'll usually do lensectomy in scenarios where my goal is to leave the eye completely unicameral. So I'll do a lensectomy. If I'm taking the lens, I'm taking the capsule and I'm stripping and I'm stripping the capsule off the zonules. Um, so here's a, a video that uh, Kirk Paco was kind enough to share uh, with me of doing a lensectomy we, we, uh, through the equator. And here we are, he's polishing the back of the anterior capsule. The anterior capsule is preserved and we can put a lens into the sulcus if we need to. Um, that's, that's just fine. But if you look at it using a Miyake uh, preparation, what we see is that the phragmatome, the pars plana lensectomy is a much less clean surgery. Um, if we look at what happens from the back of the eye, we puncture the equator or we make a hole in the poster capsule with the MVR blade. And uh, we do that on both sides. And then we put an infusion, uh, usually a needle into the, in, in, into the lens. And, and we start to fake emulsify using the frag. And, and it works, but what ends up happening is that there's always lens material that comes out and spills into the vitreous cavity. And for so many things, so here's a, a case where you're pulling the, uh, the, the I'm pulling the, the, uh, the capsule off of the uh, zonules. Um, it, it, so in so many instances where we're doing these cases, we really, really, really don't want lens material in the vitreous cavity floating around because it, 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 it's, a, it's a messier way to take out the lens and that lens material can induce inflammation later on, especially in cases of retinal detachment and PVR. So compare what you just saw to uh, a, a, a phaco vitrectomy. So here we're doing a capsorexis, we do the phaco, we put the lens in, uh, we hydrate the, uh, hydrate the wounds, we put in our trocars, um, and uh, we, we, we put in our trocars, we do our vitrectomy, we put in our dye. This is a macular hole uh, a patient. We'd peel our ILM and uh, then we put in our gas and, uh, and you know, dry the macular hole 
and, and and then we pull our troll cars out and and that's what the eye looks like this is so much more precise it's such a cleaner nicer way of fixing uh of, of doing combined surgery in with very rare examples i think the fake over uh, with very rare exceptions i think the fake ovitrectomy is the better way to do these than than the than the phragmatome using the phragmatome so what a, what about the complications of combined surgery you have plenty of complications. You can get posterior synechiae. You can get uh, there's there's some reports of less predictable refractive outcomes with in, in the setting of gas fluid exchange, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, there's cystoid macular edema there, that's been reported, anterior chamber fibrin, and IOP spikes. Yes, that's all true, um, but with good technique, those complications and those problems can be mitigated. So what, I, what we recommend and what we do here in Cincinnati is typical small incision cataract surgery techniques. Um, and the, the key thing here is it's gotta be a clean FACO, right? So if you're a retinal surgeon and you're not FACO trained, um, you know, a botched FACO, stage surgeries are always better than a botched FACO. Um, because you know, if you don't do a good job with the phaco, then you have meiosis, pigment in the anterior chamber, IOL instability, inflammation, post-op fibrin, CME. So it's important that you do a clean phaco. But if you do a clean phaco and you leave the anterior segment sealed with, with well-created and, and well-closed wounds, um, it, 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 then you're not in a scenario where you're building on quicksand um, and you're, uh, because if your FACO doesn't go well, it's always, you know, then the rest of the case doesn't go well. But if, if you're FACO trained and you're FACO competent, there's no reason not to do a nice clean FACO and then follow that with a vitrectomy. So um, I think it is important to put in large IOL optics, at least six millimeters, six and a half sometimes. Um, Avoid silicone lenses because of the fogging of the uh, lens during air fluid exchange and marring of, uh, uh, of the IOL from uh, 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 in, in cases where, uh, we play lace, where we place silicone oil. Um, I think it's really important that the cataract wounds be well secured. So I don't suture mine anymore. And about when I operate in, together with my enter segment colleagues, in about half of the cases, I'll ask that surgeon to put a stitch in because I've operated with that surgeon and they and 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 I know what their wound construction is like, and I know that when I do scleral depression at the end of the surgery, so, you know their wound construction won't 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 hold up to scleral depression. And in about half of cases, um, um, I I'm happy uh, with them just hydrating the lens. Um, <clears throat> so it's a question of experience and and wound construction. And small incision, I think that uh, I think that a stitch is. If you're doing a 2.75 millimeter uh, incision, I, I think it probably makes sense to put in a stitch, um, because remember we are putting pressure on the on the lens during the vitrectomy uh, on the eye with the contact lenses with scleral depression and even when putting in the trocars. Um, so just to show it, uh, an interesting case from 15 years ago, <clears throat> this fellow came in, 26-year-old guy with a two-year history of slowly worsening vision um, in, after a metal-on-metal -metal hammering injury uh, for which he never really sought out any care. So you see the iris heterochromia, you see the hemosiderin sitting here on the front of the, of the, uh, of, of the, uh, the, the pigment, the hemosiderin pigment sitting on the front of the IOL. And on CT scan, you see a uh, uh, presumably metallic intraocular foreign body sitting here anteriorly um, um, on the anterior retina. That's causing this. So we did a surgery, did a FACO, filled the anterior chamber with viscoelastic, um, made a, a small hole in the posterior capsule. Um, and then here is the metallic intraocular foreign body. Uh, we're enlarging that small hole in the anterior capsule. We're magnetizing a 25 gauge pick with the extraocular magnet. And if you watch right here, I'm going down with this magnetized pick and you'll see one, two, three, the foreign body just jumped up to the magnetized metal pick. And it's not a huge foreign body, but it was big enough to give him hemosiderosis. I'm able to bring this up and just nudge it through the posterior capsular rexus into the viscoelastic filled anterior chamber, then remove it through the phaco wound. Then we put a nice MA50 6.5 diopter, 6.5 millimeter lens 
into the, uh, into the capsule bag and this patient went on to regain vision and do very well. So here's another uh, case where, um, uh, where we're, um, uh, where we're uh, removing silicon oil using, this is a, using a, a, a phaco vitrectomy technique. So if I have an oil filled eye with a cataract, this is how we take out oil. So we do the phaco, standard phaco, fill the capsular bag with viscoelastic material. I put in one 27 gauge trocar and um, then I make a primary poster capsular exis. Um, this is so nice to do with uh, heads up viewing. Um, it, it's, you have better 3D, you have better depth perception um, and you can really zoom up and, and, and see this nicely. So we make a primary poster capsular exis these uh, capsular rectus forceps, these ruler capsular rectus forceps are from MST. They're uh, a lovely, lo lovely way to do a cap the poster capsular rectus here. Um, and uh, you know, it's important when you ever you make a poster capsular rectus that it be a, um, that it be a, you know, curvilinear capsular rectus without any jagged edges, because any stress that you put on that poster capsule will, will the, the, it, it'll extend. So we, Put the infusion cannula in. Here's the um, um, here's the uh, I, I manually flute put a hole into the uh, stores uh, BNL uh, silicon oil collection chamber that lets me decrease the pressure immediately, and I go through the phaco wound, through the anterior rectus, through the posterior rectus with a trimmed angiocatheter, and um, uh, I can use a gravity bottle. And, uh, and, and a FACO machine, I can use a manual syringe held by an assistant to, to create the vacuum. This is a very inexpensive and effective way to take uh, oil out of the eye. Um, and then we refill the, once the oil is out of the posterior segment, we refill the bag with viscoelastic material. We shoot in, um, I've switched over to the Gumby lenses about 10 years ago. They work so well, they, uh, that, that they're stable. Um, they, 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 do, they do just wonderfully. And, uh, and so we've, here we've done a, uh, a, a, a 27 gauge vitrectomy silicon oil removal. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we hydrate the wound. I put in one extra uh, trocar. We take a look just to make sure the, ba the back of the eye looks good. Um, I'll clean, I'll open up the poster capsulotomy a little bit, take the uh, viscoelastic out from behind the lens, do a nice scleral depressed examination, um, and, then, and then we're all finished. So I think that this is a beautiful way to do a phaco vitrectomy and take out uh, silicon oil. So, you know, combined phaco vitrectomy is almost always appropriate and almost always best for the patient. Just do it, don't be lazy. Um, uh, and that's what I tell my American colleagues. So um, the next step is, uh, you know, as, as I uh, really jumped into doing combined phaco vitrectomy, um, so, uh, so that, that uh, intraocular forearm body video was from 2004. Um, and at that time, there were very, very, very few people in the United States, retinal surgeons doing phaco vitrectomy. Um, I started doing more and more of these, and then I, and then the uh, then the the the, um, the the premium lenses came out. And the next question was, well, what about putting toric lenses into eyes that are undergoing phaco vitrectomy? Well, we all understand uh, how toric lenses work, and um, and that they have excellent refractive results. For example. Um, in 2005, the, the Alcon uh, Toric system came out and their uh, results were a 94% rate of uncorrected visual acuity of better than, uh, of 2040 or better. So I want you to just remember that 94% number because we'll come back to it in a few minutes. The reality is that um, there is plenty of evidence in the literature that if you have a patient with astigmatism and you're doing cataract surgery, it is considered standard of care to at least offer some sort of astigmatic management to that patient. Whether they can afford the toric lens or the, or, or the astigmatic management or not, it's our job as surgeons to offer it. 
And if you're doing, as a retina doctor, doing fake ovitrectomy cases, I think it is important to offer the toric lenses. But the question is, what are the outcomes, the refractive outcomes and the visual outcomes in the setting of fake ovitrectomy using a toric lens? So we did a, a case series that we published of 55 eyes at 51 patients um, back uh, that we did in, from 2007 to 2010. Um, you know, we did the typical pre-op stuff, uh, used a pre-operative photograph for a careful drawing, um, to, uh, noting the meridians of iris features and perforating scleral vessels and so on and so forth. Um, we did most of these with retrobulbars and the surgery was a typical small incision uh, uh, by manual FACO using either the Acurus or the Constellation um, at FACO modules when the retinal surgeons were doing the surgeries or the Infinity uh, which, uh, which was state-of-the-art at the time for the anterior segment surgeons. We placed the, uh, the, the Acrosofts T3, T4, T5s, because those are the only Torics that were available in the US at that time. Um, and then uh, we did viscoelastic removal, wound hydration. We finished the FACO, hydrated the wounds, um, and then we did the retinal surgery, again, using either the Acurus or the Constellation. And at the end, uh, most of the time we did a final IOL alignment check. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. So we put in, like I said, T3s, T4s, and T5s. Um, we uh, did 25 and 23 gauge surgery, mostly 25. Um, we, uh, uh, we, uh, the, the retinal surgeon did, the, did some of the FACOs, but it was combined surgery with, with, uh, with one of the anterior segment surgeons for uh, a majority of the, of the cases, about one, uh, one third, two thirds. Um, you know, we left some eyes fluid filled, we left some eyes gas filled as was appropriate for the retinal pathology. And now let's look at the results. So best corrected visual acuity is a measure of how good the retinal surgery was. So did the retinal surgeries improve the patient's vision? Answer, yes, these patients did very, very well. Um, so the retinal surgeons get to pat themselves on the shoulder for being great retinal surgeons. What about the precision of the toric IOL placement? So the deviation from the planned axis was four plus or minus six degrees. Um, a, a median was about three degrees. 85% um, were within five degrees. 93% uh, of the IOLs were within 10 degrees, but uh, four of the IOLs were more than 10 degrees off. And all of those were the first toric vitrectomy cases of an anterior segment surgeon working with a retinal surgeon who did not do FACO. And, and what happened there was the anterior segment surgeon did the case, checked the alignment, left the room. The retinal surgeon did the case and checked the alignment, mas o menos, okay? And, uh, and, and, uh, and the result was that, uh, that, that, that the lens was significantly misaligned. This taught us that there was a learning curve. The retinal surgeons need to know how to check the alignment um, and, and do that alignment check. And if need be, call the phaco surgeon back in to realign it if the lens got moved around a little bit by scleral depression. Um, the key thing here is, is that um, throughout the post-operative period, we did not see any late rotational drift in any of our 55 eyes. So all in all, despite a few cases where the lens, uh, uh, those first case scenarios where the, where the IOL uh, uh, was not where we wanted it to, all in all, we got the, uh, the toric lens into the axis where it belongs. And uh, imagine that the toric lenses work. So the preoperative corneal astigmatism in this graph mapped against the postoperative refractive astigmatism showed a significant improvement, um, uh, even with a couple of outliers um, uh, from, from, uh, from that brief learning curve. So 98% of eyes had reduced astigmatism, 85% of eyes had less than a diopter of astigmatism, and 50% of eyes had less than a quarter of a diopter of astigmatism postoperatively. Here's just a bar graph of the preoperative versus postoperative uh, uh, distribution of the astigmatism in these 55 eyes. 
So, but you know, these fancy premium lenses, they're really all about uncorrected visual acuity. That's where the money is. Um, so here's a graph of preoperative best corrected visual acuity versus postoperative uncorrected visual acuity. So does it make sense to put the toric lenses in these eyes? And the answer here is yes, clearly. 89% of these eyes had uncorrected visual acuity of 2040 or better. Now, let's take a look at the six eyes that had uncorrected visual acuity that was worse than 2040. One case was uh, an eye that had refractive surprise. Two eyes were uh, eyes that had more than a uh, 25 degree IOL axis implantation deviation, that first case learning curve that we talked about. One eye visual acuity was limited by retinal disease. One eye needed a post-operative tube shunt for glaucoma, and that uh, created a bunch of uh, a bunch of astigmatism that uh, that that knocked it out of alignment. <clears throat> uh, um, and then one eye had almost five diopters of preoperative astigmatism. Um, and remember, we didn't have the T the the T six seven eight and nine at that time. The T five six seven eight and nine. It was just a T three. So th that that eye, we put in the best toric lens that we could to reduce the astigmatism, but we weren't able to get rid of all of it. So if you look at these six eyes that failed the uh, the, the, the that failed the 2040 uncorrected visual acuity test, three of them would never have been let into any anterior segment trial for. Um, for a toric lens, um, exclusion criteria were retinal disease, or or you know severe glaucoma, or astigmatism outside the range where the where the IOL would have worked. So if you recalculate our 2040 uh, uh, alignment rate, excluding these three patients, um, these three patients which would never have been let into any anterior segment trial we actually have a 94% rate of 2040 or better uncorrected visual acuity in our phaco vitrectomy series, which is the same number that was published in the original FDA trial, resulting in FDA approval of the Alcon Acrosoft lenses, that 94% uncorrected visual acuity rate. And, uh, and we added, so adding the vitrectomy is not, it does not reduce your refractive or for that matter, visual outcomes in this selected series of patients. So um, looking at whether vitrectomy gauge, who did the FACO, uh, you know, the retinal surgeon or the FACO surgeon, gas versus fluid. And um, we didn't, the study wasn't powered to find results here. It's no surprise we didn't find any results. So, but we can conclude that putting in a toric lens is reasonable in selected patients with good visual potential that desire, who desire to minimize spectacle dependence, IOL rotational stability, refractive results, and uncorrected visual results are excellent and compare favorably to published results in the cataract only patients without retinal disease uh, that are published in the literature. And we published this in retina in 2015. So um, here's what uh, what some of these look like. Um, so uh, this is, I'm doing it off the screen. This, I did this case in 2014. Um, with an early iteration of the uh, true vision system that had toric alignment built into it. So I'm operating off the screen here. Um, you have a capsorexis template, you have the toric alignment, you have your incision um, programmed in. You know, we do our, we do our hydro dissection and, uh, and, and do our FACO. And, you know, I'm gonna speed this up a little in the interest of time. We disassemble the lens, we do the, you know, put, put in the IOL. Um, and then we check the IOL alignment. It's pretty good. It's not perfect. Um, and, uh, and here I'm nudging it just a little bit and I nudged a little bit too far. And, and uh, um, I nudged a little bit too far. So it's, it's misaligned now. So I go in with a 30 gauge needle and just kind of nudge the lens just a little bit and get it right perfectly aligned. And then, uh, then we do the, uh, then we do the, uh, uh, the vitrectomy, and I'll speed this up, and then we put in dye and do the peripheral vitrectomy, 
And here's the, uh, the, the ILM peel, the epiretinal membrane ILM peel in a patient who's moving a lot, as you can tell. So I'll speed this up. There we go. Pretty membrane peel. And um, scleral depressed examination. And, uh, and then we do the final toric alignment check after the scleral depression. And this patient went on to come back to 2025 uncorrected visual acuity. Okay, so I hope that I've made the argument that uh, that that placing that phacovitrectomy is a good thing to do, and that phacovitrectomy with a toric lens is also a good thing to do um, in in many cases. The, it gets a little bit more muddled when you deal with multifocal IOLs and retinal disease. And what I want to talk about a little bit is number one, uh, case selection. Um, then, uh, then we'll show just a little bit of data of phaco vitrectomy membrane peel and phaco floaterectomies with multifocal lenses. Um, just some preliminary data. So, you know, are multifocal IOLs a good idea for retina patients? Um, do, does the presence of a multifocal IOL change our threshold for vitrectomy surgery? So, you know, Obviously, we have to think about the visual potential of the fundus and eyes that look like this, you know, with, with horrible retinal disease, they're obviously not multifocal patients, not multifocal candidates, and we shouldn't be putting them into multifocal patients. Um, and the interesting thing is, as a retinal specialist, you know, fortunately, we have excellent cataract surgeons here in, uh, uh, we have excellent cataract surgeons here in, um, in Cincinnati, and, um, and and we don't have too many unhappy multifocal disease patients, but we definitely get them from outlying uh, from from we definitely get unhappy multifocal patients from outlying uh, uh, centers that are not us, where the cataract surgeon misses some subtle retinal disease. Here, in this case, this patient came in. Um, miserably unhappy with 2060 vision. He was 2040 preoperatively, 20, and they couldn't refract him to better than 2060 in the right eye after his multifocal lens. And you see why there's a bunch of RPE disruption from some macular degeneration and, uh, and, and RPE transmission and a shallow pigment epithelial detachment in an eye with macular degeneration. And this was missed preoperatively. Um, which is a shame for the patient and resulted in very long conversations with this patient on the part of the phaco surgeon and unfortunately on the part of the retinal surgeon as well. The amount of chair time that these unhappy multifocal patients can consume is sometimes enormous. So um, why is that? Well, we know that the multifocality of uh, 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 the multifocality in these lenses comes from um, at the expense of a hit in contrast sensitivity. It, it, and it, the contrast sensitivity hit comes from the simple fact that you know the light is focused into multiple focal planes so that it, uh, not all of the photons are in focus at the same time. For most of uh, most of us, we have the horsepower in our occipital cortex to do the whatever signal to noise ratio math is required in order to, uh, to, to still be able to see well, even with just one, one third or one half of the photons in focus. Um, but if you have retinal disease uh, uh, that can cause a contrast hit sensitivity, and you superimpose a contrast sensitivity uh, hit of a multifocal lens, sometimes you get a very unhappy patient. I like to borrow the two hit hypothesis um, uh, 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 terminology from our, uh, enter, from our uh, ocular oncology cont uh, 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 ocular oncology colleagues. Um, you know, one plus one equals the grumpy, unhappy multifocal patient that wants to sue you. Um, so let's go through some basic cases. You know, if you have an eye that looks like this, even though um, the visual acuity might be pretty good, right? This eye has no central central drusen, um, and and might come back to 2020 visual acuity after a clean phaco. Um, if you put a multifocal lens in this eye, you know, maybe maybe they have a very short period of time where they do well, but then down the road as the, uh, as the macular degeneration inevitably progresses, these eyes end up doing worse 
than if they had a monofocal lens. Um, now, if there's extra macular drusen and the, and the macula itself is clear, I don't think I'd have any difficulty with somebody putting a multifocal lens into this eye. Um, what about vascular diseases? Okay, well, you know, each of these uh, pictures here, the diabetes and the vein occlusion and the artery occlusion and the retinal arterial macroaneurysm and the, and the, uh, the central retinal vein occlusion, you know, obviously these eyes have retinal disease. But the interesting thing about each and every one of these photographs is that if you, in theory at least, if you fast forward three, five, eight years, if the patient controls their blood pressure and their blood sugar, their diabetic retinopathy can regress. This hemorrhagic vein occlusion, these hemorrhages oftentimes will regress. This artery occlusion, this pallor is gone within a couple of months. In this central retinal vein occlusion, these eyes can some, and, and, and here in this, this subretinal hemorrhage from the retinal arterial macroaneurysm, that will resolve. And, uh, and, and sometimes when you look into these eyes, they can look like they can almost have normal fundus exams. So, um, but that doesn't mean that the vascular problem that they had didn't cause some significant foveal macular functional change that persists long-term. And it's, so it's important to ask about a history of retinal disease in anybody and, and, and go through the chart carefully because if the eye once looked like this, even though it doesn't look like this anymore, that eye still had a significant retinal problem, probably not a good multifocal candidate. Um, you know, here's a very, very subtle uh, macular branch retinal venial occlusion um, that uh, a, a very subtle branch retinal venular occlusion that, uh, that, uh, that, that is easy to miss. Red free sometimes shows it to you. Uh, OCT can sometimes show it to you. But again, subtle findings can make a big difference in multifocal lens outcomes. What about peripheral vascular disease? Here's peripheral ischemia in a patient, in a sickle cell patient. You know, I think that if you put good PRP into this eye and, and get this peripheral uh, neovascularization to regress, um, Avastin, PRP, stabilize it. If the macula looks good, I, I wouldn't have any problem with a multifocal lens going into this eye. What about macular puckers? Okay, so um, macular puckers, you know, they can cause significant contrast sensitivity hits and not all macular pucker patients recover excellent visual acuity after the macular pucker is removed. Chronic tractional changes can cause disruption as you see here of the outer layers and the, the ellipsoid layers sometimes get disrupted. Um, so in a patient with a severe macular pucker, perhaps it's not a great idea to, uh, to offer them multifocal patients. Vitro macular traction syndrome. So, you know, again, in this case, it's, it, it's something you have to think about and you certainly have to counsel the patient ahead of time. In a case like this, you see some outer layer uh, attraction and, uh, and, 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 and but, but here the ellipsoid zone is pretty preserved. You know, what about macular holes? Um, you know, obviously, even if you close a macular hole and even if you get beautiful 2020 visual acuity after closing a macular hole, um, we all know that those eyes are never as good as they were preoperatively, um, at least in a subjective sense. Um, a little bit of victory macular traction syndrome, you know, with, uh, with excellent visual acuity and preserved outer segment um, uh, uh, anatomy, maybe this case might be multifocal appropriate. What about, um, what about uh, posterohyloidal traction syndrome? You know, if you've got a combination of a vasculopathy and an epiretinal membrane, I would stay away from multifocal lenses in these patients. So um, we, I, I show this in a, in, in a course that we give uh, every year at the, at the Osher uh, co course, cataract surgery, telling it like it is, um, because we push the notion of, of make sure we try to get our anterior segment colleagues to use intraoperative, uh, to use a, a OCT, uh, because OCT really helps to tell the story. Well, this OCT doesn't look so bad. So is 2060 vision a big old 
uh, cataract. There's no diabetic macular edema on the OCT or very little, just a little bit of outer retinal tubulation over here. Should this patient get a multifocal lens? If you look at the shape of the contour of this OCT, the answer is no, because there's a bunch that, that, that funny shape oftentimes is associated with, um, uh, is oftentimes associated with uh, 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 macular ischemia, and that's obviously not uh, a good idea. It's obviously not a good idea to put a multifocal lens into these eyes. So um, I'll just briefly mention drug toxicity as well to look for. You now here's a patient with plaquenil toxicity. Sometimes this can be very, very subtle to find uh, on a clinical exam, especially if you're looking through a cataract. You know, if, if you're thinking OCT and there's any question, uh, if you're thinking multifocal lens, and there's any question, please have a very low threshold for ordering uh, OCT. So here's an interesting and humbling case of progressive age-related macular degeneration from 2016 to 2019. At least that's what I thought it was um, in the right eye and then in the left eye. And it turns out that this is actually pentosan polysulfate sodium, Elmeron toxicity. It's the only FDA approved oral treatment for interstitial cystitis. It is very, very uh, commonly prescribed here in the United States. It, uh, interstitial cystitis affects a million people in the US um, and this toxicity is everywhere. Um, the average uh, exposure is, is, is over 10 years, but you can get toxicity uh, uh, as early as three years out and the maculopathy is seen in up to 20% of patients that get this. It's often misdiagnosed as AMD or pattern dystrophy. Um, I made this mistake in this patient. Um, it's best seen on autofluorescence or near infrared imaging. Um, but if you look, if it, 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 this is a very commonly prescribed drug here in the United States. If you look for it, you will see it, and it's amazing how often you'll find it. So I'll just throw up this slide. We don't have time to talk about them. There are a lot of drugs that cause, um, that, cause uh, 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 that, that can have maculopathies associated with them and we should know what they are. So um, let's talk about, a, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about another interesting patient where we did a, uh, a phaco vitrectomy. Um, and uh, uh, here's a retinitis, pig, uh, retinitis pigmentosa patient that had cataract and severe floaters. Uh, he was 31 years old. He was 20, 40 in both eyes be because of uh, central posterior subcapsular cataract, uh, 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 central posterior subcapsular cataract, and just horrible, horrible floaters. Couldn't drive because of the floaters. Um, he was a very high myope. So we did a, uh, a phacotoric 27 gauge uh, floaterectomy on him. He comes in post-operative day one, and he has 20-20 uncorrected visual acuity. And I walk in, I'm looking at the chart and I'm so proud of myself. 20-20 uncorrected visual acuity, fake ovitrectomy, post-op day one. I'm the greatest surgeon in the world. And this guy is pissed off, right? He's like, doc, what did you do to me? I can't see, I can't see. And, you know, this, these were his, uh, his uh, preoperative fields. He says, I, 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 I can't see the drive. He took his patch off and drove in on his own. Um, people are constantly sneaking up on me and surprising me. And we had this conversation for multiple visits and, and, I, and I, multiple, multiple visits. And I couldn't figure out what it was until finally I realized, ah, I got rid of his myopia. I got rid of his minima, his spectacle minimization. That minimif minification of his spectacles gave him more visual field, and he and when when we got rid of that by putting the uh, by putting the IOL in, um, he was unhappy. So the interesting thing is, once we figured out that we didn't hurt him, we explained this to him. I took this picture of my computer through his old glasses and explained it to him, and he understood it. And then we gave him a few uh, months to, uh, to neuroadapt. And the interesting thing is he started wearing a contact lens in the other eye and then said, uh, and then a few months later said, all right, doc, let's do the other eye. Actually, this is great. I don't have, I, have, I don't have to wear my glasses. So he's able to adapt. But in patients with advanced glaucoma or, uh, or other diseases causing visual field restriction, um, be aware of this change in, in the visual field. In any case, that's just a, an interesting aside. So we wanna avoid 
post-op retinal surprises, have an especially low threshold for preoperative OCT on all premium IOL patients. Don't let the cataract surgery get blamed for pre-existing retinal disease. Make the making the diagnosis before cataract surgery creates opportunities for things like combined phacovitrectomy procedures and, and to set realistic expectations. Um, let's talk about, um, so I just said, uh, whoops, hang on. Um, I just said, be careful with retinal disease and multifocal lenses. Um, that's true. So now I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth because, um, that's because I can. So here's a series of patients that we published. Um, these were mostly uh, my patients um, and doing a very small limited case series um, of combined phaco vitrectomy multifocal intraocular lens and, uh, and membrane peel, okay? So we looked at eyes, oops. We looked at eyes that had significant epiretinal membranes. Um, and we looked to make sure that the ellipsoid layer was reasonably well preserved. The outer layers were reasonably well preserved. And we said, look, we think that after membrane peeling that these eyes are gonna probably do well. And the patient was highly desirous of multifocality. So we did FACO, vitrectomy, membrane peel with a multifocal intraocular lens in six eyes. And to make a long story short, they did well visually at near and in the distance. Um, and we published this uh, uh, last year. Um, what about floaterectomies? And floaterectomies are, are a little bit uh, more interesting, I think. Um, so we did five cases of phaco multifocal intraocular lens floaterectomies. Um, and to make a long story short, they got good vision at distance and at near, um, and the patients did well. So here's two instances of, of combined phaco multifocal vitrectomy, uh, uh, two small case series um, that, 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 that opened the door to this, I think, in selected patients. Um, exactly what the right thing is to do with membrane peeling, I'm not exactly sure. We got away with it in these six consecutive patients that I just showed you. Um, I think you need the right patient. I think you need to, to set realistic expectations. Um, I think that as long as the OCT outer anatomy looks good, um, I think I think it's reasonable to offer it. Um, if there's nothing else going on, if you have a good history of a healthy retina prior to the macular pucker formation, um, if there's no underlying uveitis or other issues are going on, I think that there are those patients and I think it's reasonable. But here's some interesting data for looking at uh, floaters and multifocal lenses. So I've had several Un, I've inherited several unhappy multifocal IOL patients that I've turned into happy multifocal intraocular lens patients by removing their floaters. So, you know, floaters and do, do we do floaterectomies or do we not do floaterectomies? Um, in, in a, before the advent of 20, uh, 27 gauge surgery, and uh, we published a series on using subconjunctival anesthesia to do floaterectomy surgeries. Um, you know, vitrectomy for floaters has become much, much safer with ultra high speed, very uh, small gauge cutters. Um, and, and if we can eliminate the risk of the block or nearly eliminate the risk of the block by using subconjunctival anesthesia, and we published a series on that some time ago, I think the risk to benefit ratio of floaterectomy surgery has changed. And I've taken many unhappy multifocal patients and turned them into happy multifocal patients and then done the second eye as a combined case with the referring anterior segment surgery. So here's some data that's very interesting um, uh, from my partner, uh, Jamie Osher. He did his fellowship at the Retina Group of Washington and he, they looked at 204 eyes that underwent vitrectomy for floaters. 
back from 2010 to 2013, done by 12 of the RGW group. And the interesting thing is the post-operative duration of symptoms from uh, onset of symptoms to fluorectomy surgery was two years in patients with monofocal lenses and was nine months in patients with premium lenses. To me, that's a very, very interesting finding. Why is that? Is it the entitled and empowered um, uh, quirky multifocal personality? Um, is it the contrast sensitivity to hit hypothesis? Is it the IKEA effect? I paid for this lens, I have to see well. Is it the cataract surgeon aggressively referring the unhappy multifocal intraocular lens patient? Is it a combination of all of the above? I'm not exactly sure, but the, but the finding here is very, very interesting and raises the question of whether or not we should be changing our threshold to offer vitrectomy. So I think, and we've started to do that here in this here in Cincinnati, if you have a multifocal patient and uh, a cataract patient, and they tell you a convincing floater story, um, doing these as a combined phaco vitrectomy with a retina colleague is, um, might save you a lot of painful post-operative chair time with those patients. So the retina surgeon's perspective on floaters continues to evolve. I think, again, thinking about this gives us the opportunity to potentially avoid that unhealthy, un unhappy multifocal patient. Uh, by doing combined surgery in selected patients. So, you know, what's coming, uh, there's, there's, there's the Vividi IOL, there's the Panoptics IOL, there's different ways of looking at the, uh, at retinal function uh, that might be useful in determining uh, uh, what, which, which eyes might be multifocal appropriate or not multifocal appropriate. Um, this is all coming it, it, and, and it'll be interesting to see how it develops and how, how things go forward. So kind of wrapping up this talk, um, combined phaco vitrectomy is almost always better for the patient. Combined phaco vitrectomy with a toric IOL is a beautiful thing for all involved parties. Phaco vitrectomy, uh, um, multi, uh, phaco vitrectomy membrane peeling with multifocal lenses is possible with excellent results in selected patients. Phaco vitrectomy floaterectomy with multifocal lenses is probably underutilized. And for the anterior segment surgeons in the, in the audience, please on these, uh, if there's any question, especially in a multifocal patient, please use OCT. Um, get, get access to an OCT. It is so important and, uh, and, and shows us things that we can sometimes not see clinically. So uh, I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you very much. There are so many questions to ask you, but because of the time, could you start with another topic? Absolutely. Thanks a lot. We appreciate it. You said I have 30 minutes for the other topic, right? Yeah, okay. You said an hour. Yep, okay, good. That's what very I got. Very nice Thank you very much. Perfect. All right. So, uh, and what I'll do is I'll go through this one a little bit faster. So, don't you, don't you worry about the time. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so let's talk about endoscopy um, and uh, 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 endoscopy uh, as a different perspective for vitreoretinal surgery. Um, so we all know endoscopos, uh, to look within from the Greek. Industrial endoscopy has been around for a very, very long time. This is the inside of a rifle barrel, the inside of a jet engine, the inside of a sewer pipe with a root uh, coming through the sewer pipe here, uh, the inside of an engine, the inside of a watch. Um, we also know that medical endoscopy has been around for forever and we've seen beautiful pictures and has, it is you know, being able to internally visualize um, uh, parts of the human body has really uh, moved, the, uh, moved our ability forward to take care of patients. Um, here in the United States, ophthalmic endoscopy was introduced over 30 years ago by Marty Urim and um, and, and uh, unfortunately, it, it, this is the only unit that's, that's, uh, that's currently FDA approved here in the United States. Um, it's 30-year-old technology. 
Um, it has the, the, the endoscope has three fiber optic bundles. It has a xenon light source. It has a, an imaging fiber bundle and it has an integrated uh, diode laser. The light source um, is an unfiltered uh, up to 300 uh, watt xenon laser. You have to be very careful because the tip of that endoscope will get hot. So whenever it's not in the eye, it has to be in water. Um, you can you know, increase it and decrease it with a foot pedal and, and it's, it's a pretty hot color temperature. Um, the imaging fiber bundle is a very, it, it's a fiber bundle based imaging system with uh, 17,000 microfibers, each providing a little dot of light. Um, so the, that means that this is a 17 kilo pixel image the radius of this image here, this is the 19 gauge system, um, is 74 pixels. It is an extremely low resolution image, but a low resolution image of the inside of the eye is oftentimes better than a no resolution image on the inside of the eye. Um, they have 23 gauge uh, endoscopes now, 10,000 kilopixel uh, images that, uh, that, that will fit through a 23 gauge trocar and I'll show you some images of that in just a moment. So all of these, um, these, these tiny little images that get displayed on a standard definition monitor. Um, and remember standard definition video, this is the video that I grew up watching as a child um, is, is a 0 0.3 megapixel image. So the video that I watched when I watched TV as a child um, was a 0 0.3 megapixel image and if you think about this that what your phone can create you've got 4k video on your phone right now um, these are extremely low resolution images um, especially given the fact that this the the video display is 0 0.3 megapixels but you know the 23 gauge thing is a 0 0.01 megapixel image what do i mean by that so if you just kind of look at the pixel distribution of a 4K screen versus a 1080p screen versus a 720p screen versus um, you know, this gray box, the television that I grew up watching because I'm an old man with gray hair. Um, you know, this is what the 23 and the 20 gauge, uh, 19 gauge endoscope images look like. They're very, very limited images, um, but you can see, and uh, here's some, you know, here's, uh, you know, you can do uh, endocyclophotocoagulation. Here I'm doing a PRP not a PRP, a, uh, a 360 degree, a focal wall off laser in lieu of a scleral buckle um, in, in a patient uh, where I've just done an endoscopic uh, post-trauma retinal uh, 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 vitrectomy, clearing out the hemorrhage. And fortunately, there was no retinal detachment, but we know that these eyes are at high risk for retinal detachment. So um, it's an 810 diode laser with all the upsides and downsides of diode laser. Um, in the eye, in this, in the, uh, 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 ocular endoscopy has been described for endocyclophotocoagulation for our, by our glaucoma colleagues. Our anterior segment colleagues use them a little bit for um, uh, use them a little bit for um, uh, um, our anterior segment colleagues use it for for sutured lenses and those sorts of things. Oculoplastic surgeons they use it for endoscopic brow lifts and of course uh, retina doctors. That's what we're here to talk about today. So. Uh, endoscopy is appropriate for three different kinds of patients. The first kind are these are patients that have uh, media opacity with a limited view. So um, you know, cloud, um, you know, uh, cornea anterior chamber opacities like this, like this uh, chemical burn over here, or um, the patient with uh, uh, this chemical burn patient that might have a retinal detachment or perhaps um, a, a chemical burn patient after they've gotten their dolmen keratoprosthesis, um, there's very limited views out to the periphery in these eyes. If there's been previous iris repairs, iris prosthesis placements, um, uh, you know, eyes that are infected. Um, then there's the patients with retro irritable, very anterior pathology. Um, you know, if the, if this is the same CT that I showed in the earlier talk of that intraocular foreign body. Imagine this scenario with, uh, with, with a, a, a pupil and, uh, and a cloudy cornea. Um, 
and and we're trying to and there might be there might be a view to the poster pole but getting anteriorly sometimes the endoscope can really help with that so um, patients that have epiciliary membranes and hypotony from epiciliary membranes, patients with extreme anterior loop PVR, sometimes you can see that much better with the endoscope than you can see with uh, than you can see with uh, 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 just looking with even with scleral depression. Trauma patients, patients that are getting sutured IOLs, and then the third group of of patients are patients that where I say the eye needs less versus more inflamed eyes, eyes with uveitis, eyes with severe um, corneal endothelial damage, um, ischemic diabetics. These, so these are eyes where aggressive scleral depression and turning the eye inside out in order to get to anterior um, uh, epiciliary membranes, for example, these are eyes that won't tolerate being beat up like that. Um, and, and sometimes going in with the endoscope allows you to achieve uh, 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 the same or better anatomic uh, goals um, by being much, uh, while being much uh, uh, less traumatic to the globe. So um, let's see. So, you know what? I'm gonna just do one quick thing here. One moment, one moment. Give me two seconds. Okay, good. Okay, so here's an eye that's uh, that's uh, comes to me after being operated four times at another center with a total retinal detachment, a stiff PVR, and uh, and here I'm peeling with you know with the wide angle viewing system, and I really can't get the retina to lay down, and I go in with the endoscope, and we clearly see why there's horrible anterior loop PVR, and uh, and massive epiciliar membranes. This eye was hypotenuse, globe collapse, impending tysis. And because I can look with the endoscope and I can see these anterior membranes, I can peel these anterior membranes with, uh, with a cutter and with forceps and with sharp dissection here. I notice that, uh, that the lens is about to go south if I peel these membranes so I can remove the IOL um, before it falls into the soup. And now you see why this eye was hypotenuse. Look at the concrete that was covering this ciliary body. It's obvious that the ciliary body with, with this level of fibrosis is not going to be able to uh, secrete membranes and we take the membranes off and, uh, and expose the ciliary processes to the inside of the eye. We go to air, we put in some laser um, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and dry it and put in some oil. This eye went from light perception, came back to 2200. Um, this is my first purely endoscopic case. This patient presented 18 hours after this penetrating keratoplasty with what ended up being a serratious species Um, So I went right in immediately. I did the vitrectomy um, endoscopically because there was no view and peeled the posterior hyaloid and did a complete removal of all of the uh, virulence factors here from the back of the eye. And then we did an anterior chamber washout in the front of the eye. But then we did a nice scleral depressed examination, um, making sure that we didn't create any breaks. We didn't. And if we look at the macula, there are very few hemorrhages on the macula. This eye actually, the cornea cleared and the vision came back to 2040 spontaneously. This is an eye with a total retinal detachment that came to us after having been operated in Kansas City. Um, by, uh, by a surgeon who did not use the endoscope while doing the vitrectomy prior to placement of this parse planar tube behind a dolmen keratoprosthesis. So here we're going in with the endoscope where we can see a little bit better, um, uh, especially in the periphery. We peel the PVR and after we get the vitreous, uh, the vitrect we complete the vitrectomy, we see that the problem here is that the retina is drawn up into the capro wound for almost 360 degrees. Um, the tube shunt is there. So because we can see all of that, we can peel all of that we, using sharp dissection. Here's a, a bent MBR blade. 
um, and and we can and we can peel that scar tissue off the surface of the retina. Um, and, uh, and and here's some fibrous in fiber uh, fibrous ingrowth through the tube shunt wound that we can peel. There's some retrokeratoprosthetic membranes that we're peeling. Uh, we put in PFO, which ends up under the retina, but we can put the endoscope under the retina and peel that. We flatten the retina. We peel endoscopically, peel some last little bits of fibrosis off of the macula, um, finish the retinectomy. We put in uh, oil, um, and put in laser. And this I went from light perception in case in a little boy. He came back as a, he was, uh, I think, uh, 13, 14 years old an aniridia patient. And, uh, and he came back again to 2200, which was uh, his, his baseline was 2100 prior to, to, to all of his uh, misadventures. Um, so again, I think that this case is one uh, was is another case where without the endoscope, I don't think we would have been able to, uh, to do it. So here's a, another patient, a monocular aniridia patient that comes in in pain. Um, his baseline vision was 2125. Two months ago, he comes in with a visual acuity of light perception and an intraocular pressure of 56 on maximum medical therapy. He has a decompensated penetrating keratoplasty with four plus epithelial and stromal edema and no view to the back of the eye. What do you do for this kind of scenario? This is an eye that presumably has some real visual potential, um, you know, I, other than scream. I do a lot of screaming in my clinic. Um, well, what we decided for him was an endoscopic pars plana tube shunt. So we did the vitrectomy endoscopically. Remember, there was no view through the anterior segment at all. Um, then we here's the 23 gauge needle going through the eye. You can see the previous endocyclophoto uh, 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 cyclophotocoagulation that the patient has had, and he has he, and this patient had glaucoma despite that. So here's the the uh, 23 gauge needle for the tube shunt tract. Um, here's the uh, tube shunt now in place, and we're making sure to uh, clear out any kind of, uh, clear out the vitreous to make sure that the tube shunt is not clogged. We're doing a scleral depress uh, um, exam at the end to make sure that we didn't create any badness back there. And it turns out that we did this sort of surgery, these endoscopic parse plana tube shunts in acute scenarios. Um, in several uh, cases, uh, it, we had a series of these eyes, and uh, we achieved great IOP control in all of these eyes without surgical complications. And the key thing, key findings of our, our, our results that we published is that it's probably better in these eyes to definitively control the IOP first. What that does is that it saves the nerve and the visual potential uh, and preserves long-term visual potential and improves the likelihood of a decent long-term result with a subsequent anterior segment reconstruction after the eye has had a decent normal controlled IOP for a prolonged period of time. That's a very powerful thing to do. So, um, you know, ocular endoscopy has been around for a very, very long time. The first uh, described cases were back in 1952. And it turns out that absolutely nothing that I'm telling you is particularly new. Um, uh, uh, Frank Koch was doing endoscopic vitrectomy surgery in Germany in the 1990s, um, and actually his endoscope had higher resolution. He used a Grin endoscope, uh, a Grin rod endoscope that's actually a, a much nicer endoscope than what the current endooptics unit is. Um, so there's nothing, there's nothing new here. So the question is, if this technology has been around for such a long time, why are people not using it? Well, there are real limitations to the technology. There's no stereo, which makes it hard. We already talked about the very low resolution imaging. Um, these are rigid scopes that are sometimes awkward to get around corners and into in, and, uh, and 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 difficult to use, especially in deep set eyes or in patients that have big brows, or or uh, that have uh, or in patients that have um, uh, uh, a big uh, big noses. Um, you have to operate with a head turn looking at a screen away from the microscope. Um, there's, there's challenges with rotational orientation. It's an expensive device. Um, the the semi-disposable endoscopes are very expensive. 
Um, it does not get reimbursed at all here in the United States. So there's no business model for this technology. It's very, very frustrating. And there are alternatives. Okay? You cannot operate um, certain eyes. Patients with endophthalmitis sometimes do well with a tap and inject. You can sometimes wait for vitreous hemorrhage or medial opacity to clear. You can do what I call a may the force be with you vitrectomy, where you you go in and you can barely see, and maybe you convince yourself that you can see a little bit of something, and uh, um, and 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 you do the best you can in a limited sort of way. You can do very aggressive scleral depression. The problem, you know, but you know, the view is not good. And as we talked about earlier, there are many eyes where you where where that just won't tolerate that amount of mechanical trauma. Uh, during the surgery. <clears throat> you can use a temporary keratal prosthesis. You know, um, that creates an invasive, long, complex case. Oftentimes, it, depending on what your sewing capacities are as a retinal surgeon, maybe you have to bring a corneal colleague into the eye. It obligates the patient to a penetrating keratoplasty afterwards that may or may not be a good idea. So there are alternatives to endoscopy, but um, they're, they're, they're not very good. So uh, and sometimes they're not very good. So my personal take here is that endoscopic surgery is a difficult technique with a steep learning curve. It's incredibly rewarding if you take the time to learn how to do it because it opens an entire world of surgical possibilities that were pre previously not feasible. It changes the definition of what's possible <clears throat> and what's operable or inoperable, but it's definitely a labor of love. So what can we do to make endoscopy mainstream? What can we do to help? Well, I wanna talk briefly about trocar-based endoscopy and HD endoscopy, um, stereo endoscopy. I'll just uh, uh, show you a, a little tickler and uh, <clears throat> integration with digitally assisted vitreoretinal surgery. So I'll just show these images. These are uh, HD endoscope images. Um, of the inside of a human eye that I did in, a, in an air. Uh, so what I did here was I put a uh, 1.3 millimeter hand scope into the eye. I was at a hospital that didn't have the ocular endoscope. There was a complete, and I was in a, it was a trauma situation <clears throat> where I needed to image the inside of the eye and I couldn't. So I was either gonna close and say, I'm sorry, I can't fix you or I took the hand scope and put it in the eye. And this is, and this is what this looks like um, here. That's a ciliary body. Look at the fidelity and the clarity of these images. Um, this is another patient. Um, this is a six-year-old girl that had uh, aneridia fibrosis syndrome. Um, and, and I'm in with that same hand scope in that same hospital on a different day. Um, you can see the uh, sclerotomy here. I'm doing this case 20 gauge. Uh, this was many years ago. This young lady is uh, 16 years old now. So she's, um, <clears throat> I actually just saw her a few weeks ago. Um, and, uh, and you can see the fibrosis coming in from her aniridia, kind of creeping back onto the ciliary body. This is at the two o'clock meridian. Here's the three o'clock meridian. You see the kind of obliterative uh, 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 ciliary body engulfing aniridia fibrosis syndrome. Um, and, uh, and you can really see, here's the back of her IOL, and you can see how this kind of fibrotic process um, is, is, uh, is damaging the anterior, the ciliary body, causing hypotony. And here I am with the 20 gauge cutter trying to eat that, um, that fibrosis. I then promptly create a ciliary body bleed that I am cauterizing here with the endocautery inside the eye. So this young lady, um, we were able to get her IOP back by peeling the fibrosis off the ciliary body um, in the hospital um, uh, using this, uh, this, uh, this hand endoscope, but it's a huge hole that we had to make into the eye. And, uh, and it's, it's not really a, a viable mainstream solution, but, it, but it's, it's a proof of concept of how powerful high definition endoscopic visualization can be on the inside of the eye. Here's another image on another patient, um, another aneridia fibrosis syndrome kid. 
this line going across the, uh, the, 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 the eye is the top of PFO bubble. You can see the, uh, uh, the vitrectomy trochar in through the sulcus. And if you look, you see the aniridia fibrosis syndrome here had spread onto the anterior retina was causing a retinal detachment. And if you look carefully here at the ciliary processes, you can see individual vessels in the ciliary, uh, on the ciliary processes. This is stunning visualization, stunning detail. Um, um, you know, endobiomicroscopy really, um, courtesy of this high definition endoscope. There is a real pressing need for this to be mainstreamed. And, uh, and I'm excited about it about the developments that I can't give you any details on, but that are happening at more than one capable tech firm um, um, right now. And hopefully we can convince the marketing people um, at these tech firms to bring this to market. Um, so here I went into the eye with two endoscopes simultaneously, helped, pointed them both at the optic nerve. And, uh, and for those of you that can cross fuse, this is a cross-fusible stereo image, left eye, right eye. Um, <clears throat> there is no theoretical reason why we could not have 3D endoscopy inside the eye. And whether or not we choose to, um, uh, to move in the direction of 3D endoscopy of two lower, two lower resolution uh, images side by side uh, uh, with stereo or bail on the 3D and just go with a higher resolution 2D image that remains to be elucidated, but that's a conversation that we should be having. Um, <clears throat> another disadvantage that I mentioned to the endoscope, so here I am operating with my face turned, looking at the endoscope monitor that's to my left. Um, it's sometimes very, very annoying to have two different screens in two different locations to look at. Um, and it turns out that uh, the ingenuity um, has the ability to accept an, an auxiliary video input. And here you see the Ingenuity screen with the endoscope feed and the live surgical feed, and you can flip them back and forth. Um, that, this is what this looks like. Um, here I am peeling epiciliary membranes. And uh, um, uh, uh, again, with, uh, with the endoscope, and, um, and we see uh, 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 the, the endoscopic feed uh, live and the live uh, surgical field in 3D up in the top right-hand corner. Um, here's an, uh, an endophthalmitis patient where the view through the cornea is really very, very bad, but with the endoscope, we can see things and, and, and do a more complete vitrectomy. Here's uh, another side-by-side -side case, and it's really nice to have them side-by-side -side on the screen. Um, this is, uh, uh, it's just a very powerful way to do things. So as we talk about, um, as we talk, as we talk about auxiliary viewing, um, there are other things that we need to see during surgery, intraoperative OCT. Uh, I'll just briefly mention this and there's a reason uh, and we'll get to it in a minute. So this is what live intraoperative OCT looks like uh, of the anterior segment during surgery. Here's live intraoperative OCT. Uh, during a membrane peel. Here's a, a wide angle intraoperative OCT cube. Um, I, I, I've used all the intraoperative OCT units. The HOG right now is the most user-friendly and has the, is the best compromise between user-friendly and, um, and image resolution. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, many years ago, I became interested in intraoperative OCT and I generated this video to show the utility of intraoperative OCT. And what I did is I took intraoperative OCT video and I edited it side by side with live surgical video and, and, uh, and created this, this, this sexy video that we presented at AAO many, many years ago. Um, and, it, and it was so obvious to me when, when editing this video that having the OCT and the live surgical view side by side just makes so much sense. So we created a way to accomplish this. <clears throat> Here's a OCT of my fingernail and the live view of my fingernail. And this is what it looks like on the Ingenuity. Um, uh, this is a case I did a few months ago. Um, auto range finding um, this patient with vitro macular traction syndrome. <clears throat> and uh, again, I'm operating off the screen 3D on the right. That's the live surgical field. And then there's, uh, here's the image injection. And the and you see you can it looks good with the image injection, but the resolution on the left is much better. You can see the posterior hyoid. You can see 
And because I can see the poster high load, I can come in, I can slide under the poster high load with the vitreous cutter, and I can lift the poster high load that you see here. Um, and I'm going to speed this up in the interest of time. Um, so we can peel the poster high load, then we put, uh, we put dye in. When we put dye in, the OCT extinguishes as we remove the dye. Um, then the OCT image comes back. And by the way, if you look at the top left-hand corner of this video, you see a real time elapse. So uh, uh, time elapsed, um, you know, it's easy to make sexy videos by doing a lot of editing, but you know, right now, uh, um, including all of these intraoperative OCT acquisitions, I'm 16 minutes into this case. Here I am peeling the membrane. Um, and, uh, and, and it's interesting because as I'm peeling the membrane, I find myself going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, looking at the OCT, looking at the live surgical image and bouncing back and forth, uh, which is easy to do because we're on the same screen and it's just a little micro saccade to get back and forth, as opposed to um, having to uh, disengage from microscope oculars and then look at the OCT screen and then re-engage microscope oculars. Um, the one step that would be better than this is to actually have the OCT superimposed on top of the live surgical image. Um, you know, there are some technical challenges with that, but uh, it certainly makes sense. So here we've done a nice, clean uh, epiretinal membrane peel, in this case, of vitromacular traction syndrome. And we are less than 20 minutes into this case, um, including a bunch of intraoperative OCT acquisitions. So um, it, it's, 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 it's exciting technology. Um, so this comes up with the, uh, the, the raise the question of, you know, the, the screen being an information handling cockpit that, uh, and, and, and we know that as, so this is 1960s technology where you have analog instruments down here. And when the pilot is looking at, this is the inside of the uh, old Orbis DC-10, um, <clears throat> 1960s vintage technology. And the problem is when you're looking at these instruments here in your cockpit, what you're not doing is looking out at the window for other planes or birds or obstacles or so on and so forth. Um, you know, the F-16 has, and, 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 uh, and commercial airliners now have these heads up displays that display the information that you need um, uh, uh, live. So you can look out the window and the F-35 um, has kind of retina, uh, a helmet based retina image injection where there are sensors in the helmet that, that, uh, that tell the computer which direction you're looking and appropriately overlay targeting onto your retina so that, so that you can look at and see things and it's overlaid. So the real world is really not that far away from science fiction and we are approaching that in the operating room. And now let me take it back to endoscopy. My dear friend, Marco Mura um, did this work many years ago and was kind enough to share his slides. So there's a cardiology intravascular OCT that exists that takes uh, that takes oops, hang on that takes beautiful images of the inside of blood vessels um, and I'll go through this quickly here um, it's a, it's a rotating OCT that uh, uh, it's a rotating OCT that, uh, that, that that's almost like a lighthouse beacon and you can take this thing and Marco has done this and you can put it inside of the eye um, down here. Um, we can put this thing inside the eye and, um, and you can see retinal detachment. So this is an intraocular OCT um, and you can see residual vitreous and you can see cyclitic membranes on the ciliary body and you can see a choroidal hemorrhages and you can see um, uh, membranes and you can see retinal breaks um, and uh, and, uh, and, and membranes, and here you can see the, 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 an Alcon 4-3-4-set that's grasping a, a membrane. Um, you can see hemorrhage and you can see through the hemorrhage with the OCT and, uh, and see where the blood is, so in, in a post-trauma eye. And Marco has done this work. It's not clear to me why this hasn't, uh, why, why this hasn't gone mainstream. He was an absolute uh, genius for coming up with this application of this technology. And I think that with pressure from end users, um, with pressures from end users, here's a live side-by-side -side video. Um, uh, it's, it's very, very, uh, very, very 
exciting and we should be pushing for this technology. So what do I mean by that? So what's the holy grail for ocular endoscopy? <clears throat> well, 3D HD trocore based endoscopy that's digitally overlaid onto a wide angle fundus view with auto rotation using gravimetric sensors so that wherever you're looking, you get, uh, you get things oriented correctly and it's overlaid onto your live surgical field. Um, you have integrated intraoperative OCT, you have integrated digital signal processing, and then there's no theoretical reason why you couldn't have intra, uh, uh, integrated intraocular OCT, endoscopic OCT at the same time. So um, with that, I will end and I will say thank you very much for the, uh, for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I'm happy to take some questions. Muchas gracias. Christopher, thank you very much. Amazing presentations. And I'd like to ask you something, uh, perhaps um, about the first topic. Um, when you had to remove silicone oil from the, from the eye and you should perform a fecal, uh, could you give me some advice? Because sometimes um, it's a little hard to not, not perform the FACO, but sometimes you have some trouble with fluidics, the iris behavior. So could you give me an advice? I appreciate that. So I think, uh, it's, I think it's very important to have, uh, it's gotta be a closed system. So you've gotta, you have to have a small wound and a tight fit of your instruments. Um, you have to have a nice long tunnel. Um, and, and you need to liberally, liberally use viscoelastic material because there's definitely posterior pressure from the oil, no doubt about it, um, on the one hand. On the other hand, if you, if you, if you, you know, uh, um, on, the other, on the other hand, you know, if there's, if there's an opening in the posterior capsule, things get messy and the oil comes everywhere, but you're taking the oil out anyway. <clears throat> and, um, And I think in those cases, even if the posterior uh, capsorexis ends up not going quite the way you want it, you're not worried about the broken capsule. So as a phaco surgeon, you get anxiety every time you break the capsule. You know, there is no vitreous. It's been replaced with silicon oil. Um, you know, put the trocar in, infuse the in, in, infuse BSS, get the oil out of the eye, and then and and now and then and then drop the uh, drop the infusion pressure and uh, drop the infusion pressure and put, um, and put a lens in the sulcus with an optic capture around the nice capsule rexus. I think that's a very, very nice way to handle that. Drop, drop uh, uh, fluid infusion, I think it's very, very important. Uh, Marcelo? Uh, yes, thank you, Professor Caradilla. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for a great talk. You, you just discussed so many topics to us this morning so we, we can discuss for an hour because you spoke about all the vitreo retinal specialists and maybe in the present and the future. Uh, and I like your presentation about when you must, you should, and you may take the lens because that's a very controversial situation for our, for we as a vitreo retinal surgeons. What, what, I, I want to, to speak to you or ask you some uh, f uh, small question about, for example, in giant tears, giant tear detachment in a, in a young patient of f uh, 45 or 50 years old, You use a combined because there was some controversy in giant here about they taking the lens to put on the buckle or to or put silicon oil or gas. What's your, your current manage in giant tear detachments? So a giant tear um, in general, I don't like to do fake ovitrectomy in the setting of any retinal detachment. And the reason why is even even if you do a nice clean FACO, you're adding inflammation to that scenario. And, and what's the problem? So the problem is not, can we fix the retina? Of course we can fix the retina. The problem is not, uh, the, but the problem is, does the retina stay attached? And the answer is, well, yeah, if they don't get PVR. If the eye gets VPR, then it's a catastrophe. And I think that in the setting of acute retinal detachment repair, unless you have to take the lens because there's no view, That's an instance where I will leave the eye phacic 
because um, and and I'll and I'll live to fight another day and take the cataract out another day because I don't want any lens protein excuse me, floating around in that eye, whether it's lensectomy or phaco, there's always a little bit of lens material that's left and any phaco anaphylactic response, even a subclinical phaco anaphylactic response um, is going to increase the risk of PBR in my opinion. So in the setting of acute retinal detachment, I almost always leave the patient phacic if I can. And then if, you know, and in those instances, sometimes I'll have a lower threshold to go to silicon oil because what's the main downside of primary silicon oil placement? You're mandating that second surgery to take the oil out. Exactly. Well, right. But if I'm doing a vitrectomy on a phacic patient, I'm mandating a second surgery to take the cataract out anyway, exactly. because almost all of those patients. So I'll have a lower threshold for primary silicon oil, and then I'll do the phaco vitrectomy to take the cataract and the oil out at the same time. Perfect. I'm a, and my second small question is about... Uh, you spoke about uh, the, the multifocal and combined procedure in macular pucker or maybe in, in macular hole surgery on PDR patients. And what about the results? Do you use the microperimetry? To, because you spoke about contrast sensi sensitivity in the post-op with the multifocal IOL. What about the use of the routine of uh, microperimetry to, to measure, to assess to uh, a functional situation in, uh, in macular pucker surgery or macular hole surgery? So I think, I think multifocal lenses in a macular hole patient are a bad idea. Um, I think that uh, the, the results, uh, you know, you, you can get wonderful vision with macular hole closure, but we all know that even with beautiful surgery and recent macular holes um, and, 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 and nice anatomic closure, um, you, we don't always get great vision. Even if we close the hole, you have 20, 30, 20, 40, 20, 50 vision. We're happy with that because it's better than contadedos, right? But, um, right? Um, or, 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 or 2200, but, um, but that's not a multifocal scenario. Epiretinal membranes, on the other hand, are different. With epiretinal membranes, you know, exactly how to, I, I don't think it's known, um, I don't think it's known how to assess preoperatively what the postoperative visual acuity potential is after membrane peeling. I think that is a very in, important question, um, especially when we're thinking about things like these multifocal intraocular lenses. Are there OCT anatomical signs? Exactly. Are there are there functional signs? Um, I think that uh, microperimetry is an excellent idea to, to look at uh, microperimetry, um, and and I think it will be a large labor of love. I think those signs are there, and but I, I don't. I'm not convinced we know what they are. Um, that Rabin cone test. That's another thing. You could even think about things like multifocal, uh, multifocal uh, uh, ERG to give you kind of a, a functional assessment of what the fovea is doing. But you know, what does multifocal ERG really mean? I don't think anybody really knows exactly what it means. We um, agree in that, yeah. Yeah. So, so, but I think you're exactly right. Looking at those sorts of things that will help us to push the envelope and help us really understand what it is about the macular pucker that's causing visual loss and, and so on and so forth. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you so much. You're Emilio, would you like to ask you something? Hi, good morning. How are you? Amazing presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing we have uh, in Latin America, in Europe, the option at the moment of uh, Piggyback, piggyback uh, IOL multifocal. So uh, that's uh, that's a tendency that is uh, at the moment growing here to put a monofocal in the back and a piggyback of multifocal IOL. Uh, in that cases, in that uh, selection cases of um, Parker, for example, uh, that's what we are doing here in that cases. That's interesting. So you so you you do a so you you have a multifocal uh, implant that that has a power of zero that you can put into yeah. the bag or into the sulcus or how does yeah, that work? We, we put we put the the monofocal 
a debug uh, with the power, and then the multifocal, there are two brands here, uh, the Reiner, Sulcus, uh, Sulcuflex, multifocal, that is a diffractive multifocal aerial, uh, and there is another, uh, I, I don't remember the other, the other half, but um, yeah, you can do that, and you can also have Torix multifocal um, in the Sulcus. So that's with, fascinating with to me. That, yeah. that, that, that's the first I've known about that. So I had a case recently where, um, where um, I was, where I actually, I, I required, it was an aphakic guy after trauma with a healthy retina. And, uh, and what, I, what I wanted to do was to place a monofocal sutured CZ70 lens <clears throat> and then piggyback a, uh, a six diopter uh, uh, restore onto the back of that and suture that to the, to the lens. It, it ended up that the patient didn't want to pay for it. So we didn't do it that way. We just put in the, the, the monofocal lens, but yeah, I think that that's, that's a reasonable thing to do. And unfortunately I have to do crazy gymnastics because my government is protecting me from all this fantastic technology. Yeah, I know. Have. I know. Um, and yeah. it's, it, it's a little bit una locura, but uh, you know, it's um, I, uh, I again Europe and and Latin America have all sorts of exciting, patient friendly, good uh, uh, good technology that I don't have access to because I live in a developing nation. Yeah, it's a it's an excellent option because it's reversible. So it, if the retina pathology progress, you can remove. It's easy to remove that kind of yeah. That's that is a fantastic idea. Yeah. Yep. Love it. Professor Christopher, thank you very much. It was an honor to, for us. Thank you very much for sharing knowledge with us. And OK, I see you during the next year. Thank you very, very much again. All the I, would I would love that. And uh, it, it's, it, it's uh, thank you for the opportunity and for the honor to present it, uh, to this group. Um, have a wonderful rest of the day. They're calling for me in clinic, so I'm going to run to my clinic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, oh, doctor. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. We appreciate You're very it. welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Adios Hope to see you, see you soon. Hope to see you soon. We you admire your work. That. We admire your work. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Nos vemos el miércoles que viene a todos. Gracias. Muchas gracias, profesor. Muchas gracias. gracias. Buen día gracias. a todos. Gracias. Buen día. Gracias. Chao, Armi. Chao, Robert. Chao, Javiercito. Ivana. Chao, chao. Muy bueno todo. Muy bueno.